will stop by and have me. Bless the Lord. Where I've been, what's on my mind. They wonder why I'm not free. Praise the Lord. And still hanging the soul. Tell them I'm serving you now. Praise and the old man is dead. And the old man is sitting before you. Lord, I love you, Jesus. And the old man is dead. And the old man is dead. And the old man is dead.
Sometimes it makes me feel a little bit awkward. And I may say something like, Oh, you didn't have to do that. Or I, I'm not worthy of this. I don't deserve such a wonderful gift. Why don't you give that to somebody else? Have you ever felt this way? Yes. If you have, then you like me have, have probably learned that it really is better for us to give than to receive. And that pretty much 
sums up how I feel every October when Pastor Appreciation rolls around and you all bring me all those gifts and I'm always humbled <laughs> and, and blessed and just overwhelmed by your outpouring and your showing of love and, and support and appreciation for me. And I, I'm thankful for your generosity, but there's always a part of me that doesn't quite feel worthy of that and it creates a little bit of awkwardness that I feel inside. Now little children don't have this problem. Have you ever tried to take a small, a, a small child and to try to teach that child that it, it's better to give than to receive? They'll often have a difficult time understanding this concept and for some of them it's a little bit worse than it is others. That's because uh, that's their nature as children. They're me-centered. Uh, it's all about me. What can you do for me? And we have to teach them how to uh, show love and care for other people. That, that is something that has to be taught. Now, I've got some pretty good kids, if I do have to say so, uh, but we've had to teach them. We've had to teach them not to get upset at the birthday party when they open that last gift and then there's no more gifts left to be opened. We've had to teach them to say thank you and not to uh, you know, sit there expecting more and then get upset when there is no more. Have you ever been to a child's birthday party where uh, all the gifts were opened and, and there was no more to be opened and then to watch that child get upset and begin to throw a fit or some kind of tantrum because there was no more gifts to be received? I've seen it many times. Well, they just need to be taught yes. that it is uh, more blessed to give than to receive. That receiving the gift is, is not the best part uh, in, in this instance. But it's better when you're able to give to somebody else. Now, there was a man in the Bible by the name of Paul. And Paul believed in the importance of giving. And he tried to teach others about giving and how to give the right way and to help to have the right attitude while doing so. And in his first letter to the Corinthians, he wrote some things that got the Corinthian church all stirred up, and it aroused their zeal in their life to give. And, and they read what Paul had said to them, and after they read this letter, they were ready, they were willing, and they were eager to give. First Corinthians chapter 16 the first four verses. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto, unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet, then I go also, they shall go with me. Amen. Now, here's the background behind these verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now, apparently, there was some destitution among the Christians in Jerusalem. And uh, Vincent's word studies acknowledges that this destitution, this poverty existed, but we don't know exactly why it existed. To try to put a finger on that would just be conjecture. So we could say certainly this morning that we know there were poor Christians in Jerusalem. But we don't exactly know why. But we do know this, there was a real need. There was a real need. There were some poor people who were following the Lord back in Jerusalem, and this weighed very heavy on the heart and mind of the Apostle Paul. He had asked the churches of Galatia to take up a collection on the first day of the week, and he said, let every one of you give as God has prospered them. So uh, now in speaking to the Corinthians, Paul says, I'm going to ask you all to do the same thing that I asked the churches of Galatia to do, and that's take up a collection on the first day of the week and let every one of you lay in store in this collection as God has prospered you. Are y'all with me this morning? Amen. When Paul told them this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, what happened was it turned out to be a preacher's dream come true because they responded to it in a positive way. They were stirred up by it. They, exist, uh, they expressed their zeal for giving and they said, yes, Paul, we want to do this very thing. We want to take up this collection and we are more than happy to do so. Well, how do I know this was their response? 
because we have Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Go with me now please to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. Beginning in verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of, of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, that you may be ready. He's reminding them. He doesn't want them to be humiliated. He's saying, remember the zeal that you had for giving? Lest happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, let him so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Amen. And God is able to make all grace. Somebody say all grace. all grace. God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always have an all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. Amen. Paul had actually boasted to the people of Macedonia about these Corinthians and the zeal that they had forgiven. He said, they're ready. They're ready to give. They've been ready to give for a year now. And when the people of Macedonia heard about this, it became contagious. They got stirred up about it. Paul wanted to remind them of their commitment to giving so they wouldn't be humiliated. He's saying here, uh, you know, be ready to follow through with this giving because I've already told the people of Macedonia how eager you are to give and when the time comes and you don't rise to the occasion, it's going to make us all look bad. Yes. <laughs> now that's just some background behind these verses. But I want to focus this morning specifically on verses 6 through 8. And the message that I'm bringing this morning, if you'll pray, is seven truths for the cheerful giver. Seven truths for the cheerful giver. I hope you're ready. If you're writing things down, we've got seven of these, so I'm going to go through them quickly this morning. First of all, all this is coming right out of the Bible. First of all, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. Amen? Amen. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap spar sparingly. Well, that, that's just talking about being downright stingy. Yeah. You say, Pastor, we already know this. this. This is too simple. Then why is it that every time we pass the offering plate here at this church, we still have many people who just want to drop their dollar bill in and they refuse to honor God with the first fruits of their increase? Well, I mean, God has been good to you. Amen. Yes, he has. God has given you a job. God provides for you on a daily basis, but you refuse to give back to God because you're stingy. Bless him, God. Friends, Amen. that is not God's best for your life. Amen. Or maybe it's because you don't trust God to pay your life bill, so you want to try to hold on to that tangible money, and then when the plate passes by, uh, and you'll, you'll drop your dollar bill in, uh, uh, and you're not honoring God proportionately with the increase that He's given you. Now you're telling God you don't trust Him. Now, I want to tell you this morning that this wasn't intended to be a message when I got started on this about the collection plate passing by. I didn't intend for it to be that way. But this is where the Word of God has taken us this morning, so I'm going to follow the Lord. Amen? Because God wants you to know this morning that a lack of giving shows a lack of living. Amen? Now, you'll never... Know a fully blessed Christian life until you learn to give like God expects you to give. 
Your life will be vain. Your life will be empty. As it is for everyone who honors not the Lord and obeys not God's Word. A lack of giving shows a lack of living. And a lack of giving shows a lack of loving. So many people are reaping sparingly because they lack that love and they lack that compassion for their fellow man and that stands in the way of, of their sowing bountifully. There were poor and impoverished Christians in Jerusalem. Now this is the direct context of the Scripture. Paul had a burden to see these people lifted up and he had a burden to see these poor people encouraged and he had a burden to see them blessed. Amen. Uh, so he gave orders to the Corinthians to take up this collection just like he did for the churches of Galatia. And as far as I've studied, the Corinthian church had many problems, but I, I studied uh, long and hard on this this week trying to find any indication that this Corinthian church that had so many problems I wanted to know if they followed through with this pledge to give. I've not been able to find anything in the Bible or in any commentary that I've read that would indicate to me that they backed out of this. We know they had a lot of problems. I read one commentator that said despite all of their flaws and shortcomings that the Apostle Paul saw this good in them and he wanted to use this quality to lift them up. You know... We've got a lot of poor people around here that could really use some help today. All the churches in Kingsport put together aren't enough to meet the people, to meet the needs of the people that are poor and destitute in this area. But if we, as God's people, could get our hearts in the right place, I believe we could show enough love of Jesus Christ to impact every life in this town. I believe this morning that a lack of giving shows a lack of loving. I don't know about you. Secondly, we see the polar opposite of this first point in the next phrase. And that is this. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Amen? Amen. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Amen. And that word bountifully just means this. In order for blessings to continue to accrue. That's what bountifully means. In order for blessings to continue to accrue. One Greek lexicon I consulted likened it to God granting continual fertility of soil in a certain field. Here it's used specifically of the blessings of Christian people sent to their brethren. They sowed bountifully to these poor saints in Jerusalem. They sowed bountifully to them and it was a blessing to them. Friends, your bountiful sowing can be used by God to bless people. Bless people that He loves. And then God will grant bountiful blessings to you in your life. Bountiful giving shows bountiful living. Now, I'm going to give you just a little bit of my personal testimony. Y'all are mighty, mighty quiet this morning. I hope this will bless you and lift you up a little bit. I had nothing in my life did you hear what I said this morning? Yes. I had nothing in my life until I became a child of God Amen. and I started giving back to the Lord out of what God had blessed me with. Amen. I've not been perfect down through the years. But the fact that I have a house to live in today and the fact that I have a roof over my head this morning, I attribute that directly to the wondrous blessings of God uh, directly uh, because of these verses right here attributed in my life. Right. If it wasn't for the Lord this morning, I wouldn't have a home to live in. Amen. And many people today do not. So I'm thankful to God who's blessed me bountifully with blessings that continue to accrue. He's blessed me bountifully with fields that continue to be fertile. Bountiful giving shows bountiful loving. Go with me please to Mark chapter 12. Bountiful giving shows bountiful loving. The Gospel of Mark chapter number 12. Verse number 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury 
and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all, cast in the, more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Here's a woman who had love in her heart. Amen. Now you may say, Pastor, how do you know that she had love in her heart? Well, what other reason, my dear friend, can you think of for a poor widow woman here in Mark chapter 12 to give every penny that she had in our way of speaking? Was it because she hated people? Was it because her heart was full of hatred for somebody? Of course not. To the best of my study, this treasury that Jesus referred to here in the Word of God would have been like a chest in the temple used as a collection box. And there were several different types of these. And this would have been for the, uh, the offering that the Bible refers to as a free will offering to support certain services of the temple. This poor widow, she came along and she gave all that she had. And as I think about her gift, Religious custom reckoned her offering small, but in relation to the means of the donor and the heart of the donor and in the judgment of God, the gift was exceedingly great. Bountiful giving shows bountiful love. Are you loving bountifully today? Thirdly, very quickly, there are, we are to purpose in our hearts to give. Purpose in your heart to give. Every man, in verse 7 again, according as he purposes in his heart, let him give. This word in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 means to bring forth of oneself in preference over something else. So when we as Christian people give, we purpose in our hearts to do so. That means we make this choice ourselves. Nobody else can give in your place. Nobody else can bring forth on your behalf. We must bring forth of ourselves out of our storehouse. And when we do that, we, we give because we have gladly made the choice to give and we have preferred to do that over anything else that we might have otherwise chosen to do with the things that God has given us. We purposed in our hearts to give. That's what it means to purpose in your heart. A heart purposed on giving is a heart that's in tune with God. When you have a heart that's in tune with God, somebody may ask, what does that look like? It's a picture of someone who reads the Word of God and sees what God has to say about giving of yourself and of your possessions and you put that into action. You're in tune with God. God speaks to you. You obey what God says and then God carries out His purposes and plans through you beautifully. It's like a car that's in tune. It's firing on all cylinders. There's no miss in it. When you're in tune with God, nothing will stop you. When you're in tune with God, nothing will hinder you. Nothing will keep you from giving and living for the Lord. Amen. People with hearts in tune with God won't rattle off a list of excuses for their poor decisions and their lack of trust in the Lord. They won't give excuses for their disobedience and their uncommitted lives. But they're like a machine that just goes on and on and on for the Lord. That's how I want my life to be, don't you? A heart purposed on giving is a heart that can be used by God. We went last night with uh, some of these folks in here from uh, to Lamplight Theater, and we watched that production last night. And then Billy Wayne got up after the production and started talking about all that that ministry has been able to do for the Lord. Now, uh, you know, I'm not saying he was boasting in himself or any, anything like that. I'm not. I didn't take it that way, and I don't want you to take what I'm saying that way. He was giving praise to God for what they've been able to do. But uh, he got to talking about how they were going to have a semi truck. 
come down from Pennsylvania and just bring in a big old tractor and trailer load of blankets and things like that and send it down here in Kingsport and they're just going to open that thing up and give out of it until they don't have nothing left to give. I think that's wonderful. Yes. I think that's a great thing. But if we don't have a heart that's purposed on giving this morning, we'll hear things like that that other ministries are doing and we'll say, well, what's the use in us even trying? We're just a small church. We've never been able to bring in a tractor and trailer load of stuff to give away to the poor. Everything that we could do will never compare. What's the use in even trying? I want to tell you, that's a lie straight yes. from the pits of hell yes. that's sent to discourage and to tear down God's work. Keep your heart purposed on giving and keep your heart purposed on the Lord. They could bring in 10 semi-trucks, amen, and sit up down there in Kingsport uh, uh, and I guarantee you that there will still be needs in Kingsport, Tennessee that only this church can fill. if I can because I know there's more than enough around here for all of us to do there's tens of thousands of people right here in Kingsport who need God people are constantly moving into this town and they're constantly moving out of this town every day and we need to be working and giving every day and if your, your heart is purposed on giving God will use you fourthly our giving should not be done grudgingly our giving should not be done grudgingly. This word grudgingly is the Greek word lupe. It's used of the Bible uh, to speak of sorrow and pain and sadness and people who are in mourning. Have you ever known any givers that meet that description? Yeah. Have you ever just noticed Maybe been sitting in a church service minding your own business and you notice the offering plate go by and somebody dropped their dollar bill, bill in and they just look like they're mourning the death. <laughs> of a loved one. <laughs> well, Ralph, what's the matter? Did you lose a loved one? <laughs> yeah, I did. His name is George. <laughs> George Washington. <laughs> Don't let your giving be like that. Don't let your giving bring you sorrow and pain and sadness. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not standing up here saying this morning that you ought to you know, study people when they're giving at church and try to see every little thing that's going on and, and try to count the money they're putting in the offering plate and all like that. But sometimes you just can't help but notice things. I've seen people who sit in church and the look on their face look just like Fluffy just got ran over because they had to let go of a dog. In specific reference to this verse, one definition of this word grudgingly that I found, it said this, with a sour and a reluctant heart. Given done grudgingly, grudgingly is with a sour and a reluctant heart. It's done with sorrow. Amen. Don't be like that. Amen. Don't be like that. Giving done grudgingly does not reflect God. God didn't give grudgingly, did He? No. no, He didn't give grudgingly. The Bible said that He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Oh, I'm thankful He wasn't a grudging giver. He was ready and willing to give because He loves us. The Bible also tells us that we have a Heavenly Father who knows how to give good gifts Amen. unto His children. If we're going to live lives that reflect the character of God, we need to give without grudging because that's what God does for us. Fifthly, our giving should not be done out of necessity. Now, giving out of necessity speaks of people who give because it has been imposed upon them by the external condition of things or a law of duty in regard to, to one's advantage, custom, or argument. In other words, you're just giving because you feel obligated to. You feel like it's your duty to give, so you do it. It doesn't necessarily bring you grief, but you really don't enjoy it. You're just fulfilling your obligations. You see, that's giving out of necessity. 
God said in His Word through His inspired writer, the Apostle Paul, don't let you give and be like this. Do not give out of necessity. Giving out of necessity shows a vain and an empty heart. When you give, your heart's got to be in it. Yes, Christian people should have a sense of duty. Yes, you should feel a sense of obligation. But your sense of duty and obligation is not a distress to you, but it's a joy to you. Paul felt a sense of duty and obligation. Amen. Uh, in the Word of God, or the writer Jude rather said in, in verse 3 in Jude, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. That word needful in Jude verse 3 is the same word translated necessity in these verses we have before us this morning. The word needful. Paul felt it was his duty. Or the writer, I keep saying Paul, but Jude here in the Word of God felt it, it was his duty to write unto these people and exhort them to earnestly contend for the faith. God says, don't let your giving be done out of necessity. One commentator said those who give out of necessity do it like it's pulling eye teeth. Another said they give out of necessity because they don't know how to refuse. The implication here is if they knew how to refuse, then they would refuse to give. But they don't know how to refuse. Don't do it just because you feel obligated to do it. Do it because you're happy about it. Why? Because God loveth a cheerful giver. God loveth a cheerful giver. That's truth number six this morning. This is speaking of a merry giver with a merry heart. One who is prompt and one who is willing to give. The Greek word for cheerful here is uh, hilaros. That's where we get our word hilarious from. Now be careful here because there are Bible scholars who are split down the middle on whether or not we can take hilarious and transliterate that into this meaning right here. Some say you can, some say you can't. But I want to tell you one thing I know for sure. It's talking about somebody who gives with a merry heart. They're happy. They're happy to give. They're a cheerful giver. They're merry about it. God loves a cheerful giver. That's what the Bible said. But think about it. Really, doesn't everybody love a cheerful giver? We all love a cheerful giver. Who doesn't? And the Bible never said that God loves the one who gives grudgingly. It never said that God loves the one who gives out of necessity. Now, I'm not telling you He does or He doesn't. I'm just saying it specifically says here in the Word of God that God loveth a cheerful giver. It's the only type of giver that says that God loves them here in these verses. A cheerful giver is someone who is in order with the system that revolves around the cross of Jesus Christ. Nobody will ever be able to earn their salvation. Your salvation comes to you this morning as a result of the grace of God that's given to undeserving people. Any giver who says that they're a Christian and they're not a cheerful giver, that person is out of line with God's plan and God's law of redemption that we are placed under by His grace this morning. A cheerful giver is one who gives in proportion to his resources. This ain't talking about you making $1,000 a week, bringing home $1,000, and then you're cheer cheerful about dropping a five spot in the offering plate. <laughs> talking about the one who's cheerful and given in proportion to how God's blessed you. Yes. Give proportionately and be happy to do so. Again, now we could talk for a long time this morning about giving of yourselves and giving of your time and all these other type of giving that somebody may be sitting there wondering why is he not mentioning that? Because this is the specific context of these scriptures this morning. Taking up a collection for the poor saints of God back here in Jerusalem. So that's what we're looking at. We're just talking about what the Bible's talking about this morning. I'm not adding nothing to it. I'm not taking away from it. But God wants us to be cheerful givers. People who are happy to give, and they do so with a merry heart. If you're not a cheerful giver this morning, my prayer and desire for you is that you'll ask God to help you today to become a cheerful giver. Why is that important to us? I believe this is revealed in the last truth I want you to see this morning. In verses 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8 and God is able 
to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. God is able to make all grace abound unto you. Notice here it says, all grace. That's everything that you'll ever have need of, my dear friend. God can make it super abound. He can give it to you in abundance and you'll have more than enough. Now, I'm going to bring this message to a close right here. Perhaps we'll be able to revisit these scriptures again one day and glean some more truth from them. But I believe the Lord uh, wants us to close now and give an invitation this morning. Are you a cheerful giver? Or are you one who gives grudgingly or out of necessity? I, I just want to put that question to you this morning and ask you to examine yourself in light of this message. God sent this message today. I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that God sent this message today because God wants us all to be cheerful givers. And if you're not a cheerful giver, why don't you ask God to help you become a cheerful giver? Come in prayer before the Lord and ask God to show you the positive steps that are necessary and what you need to do in your life uh, for you to be the cheerful kind of giver that God loves. Now I'm going to tell you church, the Holy Spirit of God <coughs> is amazing. The Spirit of God is amazing. You may be here this morning and the Spirit of God spoke to your heart about a specific need or about a specific concern or about a specific person and you'd like to pray this morning for them or you'd like to come and pray for guidance from the Lord. Don't let anything hinder you this morning from coming to pray. Don't let anything stop you from coming to pray on this altar this morning. For those of you here today who may be apart from Christ, who don't know Jesus Christ in a saving way, Christ came, He died, and He rose again. And that is the reason we're here today. We love Him. We worship Him. We adore Him. We live for Him. We're not perfect. But thank God we're saved. He's forgiven our sins. And He's made a way for us to avoid a devil's hell. Thank you, Lord. He'll forgive your sins too if you believe in Him. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you too can be made a new creation in Jesus Christ. And if that's you and you'd say this morning, Pastor, as we bow, every head bow, every eye closed this morning, would you bow with us, please? If that's you today and you'd say, Pastor, I'm believing in Christ right now. And I'm turning from a life of sin. And I'm turning to God. I'd love for you to walk down this aisle this morning and let me know so I can pray for you. And I can pray that God will bless you as you begin your Christian walk and your Christian life with God. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for meeting with us today. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the message that you sent down. May we all take heed and apply to our hearts and lives and acknowledge that this word that was spoken this morning may be plain and evident to all. That this wasn't the imaginations of a man's heart. But that this was a message sent down from above. God, I pray that we all move up to your word this morning. Save that word which may be lost. Save to the uttermost. We thank you and praise you for all that you're going to do in Christ's name. Amen. As we stand this morning, if you'd like to come pray, come on, front, back, left.
Let's rock.